What's wagging my tails? I'm Robert Evans. This is Behind the Bastards. Uh, Sophie is giving me the thumbs up for that intro. Uh, this is a podcast. We talk about all the bad people, stuff you don't know about them, all that good jazz. My guest with me is James Heaney, actor, comedian. James, welcome to the show. Hi. It's a super big pleasure to come in here. I've listened to a lot of episodes. I've spoken towards the speakers in my car. This is the first time I'm going to get responses. <laughs> I'm really happy about that. Well, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you, you shout at my disembodied voice. I like to imagine thousands of people doing that into their cars every morning. It Whenever I see me. somebody else talking to themselves in the car, I imagine they're listening to Behind the Bastards. Ah, so do I. So do I. It, it's narcissism in my case, <laughs> but it's very flattering in yours. <laughs> Thank you. you. You know, I, I don't want to blow too much time, but... I always start the first episode thinking to myself, gosh, this person could be me. Yeah. And then the second episode, I'm like, thank God there's some distance between <laughs> myself and this monster. Well, uh, James, you got anything you want to plug in the P zone before oh, I, we drop I sure into this would. episode? Uh, I'm part of the same network, mm -hmm. Alchemy This. It's twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, improv podcast with Kevin Pollack. Yes, that Kevin Pollack. And specifically, we have a live show at the Dynasty Typewriter Theater on May 7th at 8 p.m. Gosh, it would be great if everyone came. It would. Everyone, uh, book a ticket to L.A., uh, flood the theater. Do not let them not seat you. Oh, Demand absolutely to do be not. let in. Bring weaponry. Um, force your way in. Riot. Well, well, well that might be, be just just crossing a threshold <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, you're You probably, might find yourself in the second episode of Behind the Bastards with, we, that, as, with that attitude. We're, we're gearing up for that. I do like to urge crimes every every third or fourth episode. <laughs> just to, just to, just my little way of thumbing my nose at the FTC because mm. they can't they can't do anything about podcasts. I didn't realize they had no control over. No, this. they don't. Not over podcasts. It's we're in international waters of of radio. Like it's the there's there's no law here. There's no maps for these territories. And do you worry? ever that people are going to get your, your tricks? Like, I heard some stash tricks about drugs the other week, and uh, I thought maybe all the cops know it now. Yeah, that, see, that's part of what I, I, I worry about, which is why I don't tell my good stash tricks on the air. But if they're listening, they got to be cool, right? Yeah, they're, they they got to be cool cops. There's a certain threshold of yeah. coolness yeah. that yeah. goes along with a listener yeah. of Behind the Bastards. Exactly. So we assume that, like, those of the cops will let you slide for a little bit of weed or a quarter <laughs> pound of meth or, you know, just, like, little stuff, you well, know? Okay, a quarter pound's a lot of meth. <laughs> Not if you're not if you're doing a lot of meth. True. Like, that's true. just a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> anyway, uh speaking actually of, of 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 drug dealers, uh we're talking about drug dealers today. Probably the most successful, wealthiest, uh, and deadliest drug dealers in the history of the world. Have you ever heard of the Sackler family? I have not heard of the Sackler family. Have you ever heard of Oxycontin? I have heard of Oxycontin. <laughs> yeah, we have all heard yeah, of Oxycontin. I've, I have heard. <laughs> yeah. That's actually not, I, I don't like Oxycontin. Never done it, never yeah. done it. Uh, I'm free to, to say I've done a lot of things, never mm. touched Oxycontin. See, I really like painkillers, and I have messed around with Oxy a couple of times in the past, and it's one of those things where I, I won't let myself buy opiates because I know I would develop a problem like fucking that because I really enjoy them. I had an injury when I was early in college, and I had like Vicodin or whatever. I don't know. Maybe it was codeine, mm. whatever pill they gave me, but it wasn't as good as acid, and it wasn't as good as the other things I was doing, and I was so worried that it would have a counter effect that I ended up not taking them, and I think I've really dodged a bullet because I've got an addictive personality. Yeah, it's that's like one of the ones to really avoid because that'll, that'll fucking kill you pretty fast. Which is <laughs> like, so upsetting because it's legal. Yeah, it's super legal, uh, super hard to control, and really easy to go from like, like if you're just taking the pills, that's reasonably safe, but the problem is people escalate and they start extracting the oxy from the pills or they move up to fentanyl and then they're they fucking kill themselves yeah and it's like it's just so hard to moderate like it's even alcohol like you know probably on a societal level causes more problems but it's harder to kill yourself with um maybe not i guess that you know it's easier to kill other people with alcohol <laughs> so nobody's nobody's ramming a car into somebody else while they're they're hopped up on oxy probably probably so. actually i would say that I, I i wouldn't put my seal of guarantee that people aren't driving on oxycontin definitely are yeah. driving on it i just think they're less dangerous probably so if you're a drunk driver Switch to oxy. We should just roll right into this episode. <laughs> yeah. <now. laughs> wow. Wow. I'm sweating and you're talking. <laughs> Don't break the law. Break the law. <laughs> I heard that whisper. <laughs> I'm Robert. Oh, wait. That was, that's the <laughs> intro. I'm just going to start reading the episode now. 
In the early 1900s, before World War I, Sophie and Isaac Sackler immigrated to the United States from Poland and Ukraine, respectively. They were both Jewish, which you may recall was not a great thing to be in Poland or Ukraine around the turn of the 20th century, or a couple of decades after the turn of the 20th century, or, like, pretty pretty rough now. I don't want to sound <laughs> ignorant, but I didn't realize that early on it was bad. I thought it was oh, yeah. towards, like, the 20s. No, I mean, it, it was bad. It was got worse then, but, like, you know, the late 1800s, uh, there were the Chelmniski Massacre, which was, like, a bunch of Cossacks killing, like, it might have been as many as half a million Jewish people. Wow. Like, the biggest pogrom in Russian history. And that, I think, was pretty close to Ukraine. It might have been in some of what is, I, I don't know the exact geographical area, but, like, yeah, it, it was pretty rough. A lot, a lot of bad stuff happening. Um, and I, I don't know if the Sacklers fled uh, Eastern Europe because of, you know, uh, a desire not to get murdered or because of crushing poverty, but it was probably like a mix of the two. Mm -hmm. um, so these refugees established themselves in New York City. Isaac became a grocer. He and his wife had two children, the eldest of which was Arthur. Arthur grew up to become a psychiatrist. His specialty was something called biological psychiatry. He was the very first physician in the world to use ultrasound for a diagnosis. He was a major critic of electroconvulsive therapy and was a significant figure in the racial integration of New York City's blood donation. So, mm. it's pretty good so far. I kind of am a critic of the electrotherapy myself. So, I, yeah. I, I, I kind of am on his side. I believe they still use it sometimes. There's certain things that it really does help. Because I know some people who have, have found it very helpful. But like, I've heard the same thing. It's so hard for me to believe. It seems so barbaric. I think the problem was they used to do it for like everything. Yeah. Like, oh, your daughter's looking at guys, let's shock her skull. Like, there's a couple of things it really does help with, and now they pretty much only do it for those things. I, well, I thought the overdiagnosis of ADD was a problem. I yeah. guess we're I guess we're lucky we're we're progressing. Yeah, if they I mean they just hit you back then for having ADD in like the 50s like that was that was your riddling was, <laughs> was getting punched. Well, better okay. than the shock therapy, I think. I don't yeah, know, maybe yeah. it depends. Depends Probably. on the hand. Fair enough, yeah. Now, uh, at this point the Sackler family seemed to be living the uh, epitome of the American dream. They'd gone from dirt poor refugees to well-off groundbreaking physicians in 50 years. Pretty cool. I'm impressed. Pretty cool. But in 1952, Arthur made a fateful purchase that would, decades later, cripple the United States and secure his family a place in historical infamy for all time. He bought a company called Purdue Frederick, a pharmaceutical drug maker. Now, Purdue Frederick had been established in 1892, selling what were called patent medicines, essentially snake oil. Prior to Arthur's purchase, Purdue Frederick's main product had been Gray's Glycerin Tonic, a broad application remedy sold as a cure for basically everything. It was mostly wine. <laughs> yeah. It cures some things. It does cure it does, some like, things. I've definitely had some things cured. Mm -hmm. But when I have a nasty case of the sobriety, I just break open a bottle of medicinal wine. and you know, That solves it very, immediately. Very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Very, very fast. Now, Arthur put his brothers, Mortimer and Raymond, in charge of the company. Morty had been born in 1916 and Ray in 1920. Both brothers were also psychiatrists. So the whole family goes into psychiatry, which... You know, good for the parents, high achieving kids. Yeah, I mean that's impressive. They're they're owning stores. I guess yeah. colleges were different back then. Yeah, I mean, it how costs did like twenty dollars? Yeah, yeah, like oh. you had you mow a couple of lawns and you can get your bachelor's back then. Like, <laughs> wow, oh yeah. man. Yeah, uh. yeah, it's one of those things. You look at like even in the seventies, you could work part time and pay off college by the time you graduate, and it was like. Don't now, make me cry on, yeah. on on microphone right here. <laughs> now it costs as much as two new trucks. <laughs> like, and that's not a great college. So all three kids were psychologists. Psychiatrists. Psychiatrists. So, like, so they're, oh. they're able to like, they're actual doctors. They, uh, yeah. they, which makes sense. Yeah. Purdue. Purdue, exactly. So Arthur put his brothers, Mortimer, oh yeah, he put them in charge of the company. Uh, so Arthur was free to devote himself to what was increasingly his passion, marketing. I'm going to quote from a fantastic Esquire article by Christopher Glazik. Quote, Arthur intuited that print ads in medical journals could have a revolutionary effect on pharmaceutical sales, especially given the excitement surrounding the miracle drugs of the 1950s, steroids, antibiotics, antihistamines, and psychotropics. In 1952, the same year that he and his brothers acquired Purdue, Arthur became the first ad man to convince the Journal of the American Medical Association, one of the profession's most august publications, to include a color advertorial brochure. So, that's this guy's, like... Well, that's the fucking problem. Yeah, yeah, that's like if you start marketing, <laughs> if you start marketing drugs, then that means you're spending money because you want to make more money. And is that not the whole fucking? Sorry, I'm, are you? I don't know if there's a cursing on this. Yeah, there's plenty of cursing. Uh, I guess yeah. there is, but it's just upsetting because that's the root of the problem. It yeah. should never have been like, oh, marketing's where we're gonna yeah. really make our break. Your marketing should be the doctor being like, 
you have this problem and this medicine will help for it. That's the only yeah. marketing drug shit happens. Yeah, you shouldn't be exactly. like looking at color. Do you have these spots all over your body? Yeah. Well, how about a measles vaccine? Maybe I need this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you don't and nobody advertises like, do you want polio? Probably not. <laughs> yeah. Check out this new shot that'll take care. No, you just give people the polio vaccine so they don't get sick. <laughs> Now, Purdue's first big hit was Librium, which was the first name Valium was marketed under. Mm. Arthur pitched Librium as the key to treating psychic tension, a phrase he invented because it sounded sexier than saying stress. Arthur suggested that psychic tension was the real cause of many maladies, from heartburn to bad poops. The tactic worked like fucking gangbusters. Valium became the most widely prescribed medication in the United States, the first drug to break the $100 million sales record. Arthur was quickly inducted into the Medical Advertising Hall of Fame, a thing which should not exist. No, it shouldn't no, exist. No, why, why, why would you be proud of that? <laughs> now, this might be outside of your realm of thought, but was Valium kind of the trade-off of what they used to do lobotomies? Like, wasn't it, was, is there, uh, I don't, I'm, I think they were still lobotomizing people they at this were. point. In, this is like the 50s, so if I'm not mistaken, this is when, um, I think Rosemary Kennedy was her name, the JFK's youngest sister, when they like scrambled her brains mm -hmm. uh, because she liked boys. Um, so I think they were still doing that at this point. They were. But, so it has yeah. nothing, because I thought that lobotomies and Valium kind of had a crossover of, like, they who might they were have been. Like, it might have, like, I, I just don't know that. I don't um, know either. I could see it, I could see it helping with that. I, uh, I've taken it recreationally a couple of times. When I, I was living haven't. In, yeah, when I was living in Guatemala, you could just pick it up from the corner store. So we would actually pick up, uh, uh Valium and, and Hydrocodone, and it was like, that was your, that was your, like, Thursday night or whatever. Uh, mm. It was it was fun. I met this Irish biker who was like traveling, biking all the continents. And now, when it, you say biker, I need to know the difference. Is it pedaling biker or no, motorcycle? No, huge bike? fucking motorcycle. Makes Big sense having hog. drugs. Yeah, 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 sure. He just he spent like three weeks just doing all of the Valium. I've never seen anyone do more fucking oh my Valium. God, just Aunt... crushing it up and railing three at a time. <laughs> yeah, that's just never been my party drug. No, I I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, but. Yeah, it sold very well for, for Arthur Sackler. So, uh, it was Arthur who began the Sackler family tradition of donating huge sums of money to museums. Some of this may have been honest generosity, but a lot of it was also a tax thing. When he created the Sackler Gallery at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, he gave it a huge collection of Chinese artifacts, but he required the museum to sell him the artifacts he was giving them for a very low price, what he'd paid originally in the 1920s when he'd acquired them, so he could then donate the artifacts back to the museum, but write them off at their 1960s value so that he made net money donating these things to the museum. <laughs> It sounds like a scam. Is that it's a scam? Def it's definitely. It, the it's only like, reason it's not a scam is because he has enough lawyers to sue you for calling it a scam. Oh, that's yeah. true. It sounds like the art version of a shell company. It's absolutely <laughs> that. Like, it's legally distinct from a scam because he can afford to pay lawyers. Mm. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's it's the same thing as like that guy on the street corner putting like a a, a, a dot or whatever underneath a bunch of cups and asking you to bet on which. Like, it's <laughs> it's a con for sure. Now, Jillian Sackler, Arthur's third wife, does call this allegation fake news. So that should tell you another when, little thing. When about. was that? That was third? recently. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, that's yeah. a very new term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was but very But that also recently. makes sense, third wife. He has yeah, to... yeah. He's, he, he had to re-up a couple yeah. of times. Yeah, I think they all did. In general, the Sackler brothers seem to have been uh, the kind of rich people I would not have gotten along with. Mortimer threw a fit on his 70th birthday when the Met agreed to let him throw his birthday party there, but they wouldn't let him redecorate an ancient shrine that he wanted as the centerpiece to his party, so he got very <laughs> angry at them. Like, that's the, the attitude this family has. So, that said, there was nothing super evil about this generation of the Sacklers. They were questionable. The, oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, they were Sorry. Yeah, they were questionable, but they weren't like mustache-twirling villains. They also weren't that rich by rich people standards. They were multimillionaires, but not billionaires or multi-billionaires. Raymond and Mortimer had paid attention to their brother's success with Valium. They realized that if you could just take a powerfully addictive substance and then market it as a cure-all for a bunch of different things... Well, that was incredibly profitable. So they started looking for another drug that they could basically apply the Valium strategy to. In 1972, a London doctor had developed a special slow-release medicine technology. In 1981, MS Contin entered the UK market. It was a timed-release morphine pill designed to hopefully be less addictive than traditional morphine. In 1987, Purdue Pharmaceutical brought MS Contin to the US market. Now, the drug was a big hit for cancer patients, and Purdue made a tidy sum helping suffering sick people endure their mortal illnesses. I'm just, oh, yeah, yeah. I, whenever I hear something, I got to ask yeah, yeah, yeah. a questioner. So when they think it's going to be less addictive, do they think it's going to be less addictive because it's something that is not creating a habitual use because it's slow release? 
That's and, exactly like it, it's not like one of the big things you're trying to avoid is the euphoria because like taking painkillers gives you this like feeling of euphoria mm-hmm. when you first come up and that's one of the things that's most addictive about it. So the idea was that if it's slow release, people won't get hooked as easily. It will be less pleasurable, but it will fight pain more effectively. So number one, you'll have to take fewer pills. Um, and number two, you're less likely to develop a habit. And yeah. Just like shooting and someone up with heroin, you know, like one of the, there was a big uh, stigma against opiates at this point in the United States in like the 70s and 80s because a bunch of young men had been given morphine basically um, in Vietnam. Like they'd get shot and they'd get shot up with morphine and then they wound up horribly addicted to morphine. Mm -hmm. And so like there was a real stigma against taking any kind of opiate painkiller in the U.S. for like during this period. So MS Contin was really only used by cancer patients. Like it was the only people who would get prescribed this kind of medicine were people who were like dying essentially. Um, so, you know, Purdue made a decent amount of money off of it, but it was impossible to make a lot of money off of it because it wasn't being prescribed for anything but mortal illnesses. MS content was unlikely to ever become a Valium level seller, and that was a problem for Purdue Pharmaceuticals. Fortunately for the Sackler family, and unfortunately for the entirety of rural America, in 1986, two doctors published an article in a medical journal that suggested, based on a 38-patient study, that long-term opiate use was safe for patients without a history of drug abuse. This, combined with a widespread, completely fallacious belief that the rate of addiction for long-term opiate use was less than 1%, helped convince the leadership at Purdue that opiates were the future of their company. It was a future Arthur Sackler would not live to see. He died in 1987. His last words to his family were, reportedly, leave the world a better place than when you entered it. Oh, those are great words of wisdom. Great words of wisdom. You want to you hear about how his family didn't, didn't do any of that? Uh-oh. <laughs> Oops to the dupes. Yeah. From this point on, Richard Sackler, Raymond's son and Arthur's nephew, would grow to become the head of the family and eventually the company. Here's how Esquire described him. Quote, Perhaps the most private member of a generally secretive family, Richard appears nowhere on Purdue's website. From public records and conversations with former employees, though, a rough portrait emerges of a testy eccentric with ardent, relentless ambitions. Born in 1945, he holds degrees from Columbia University and NYU Medical School. According to a bio on the website of the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research at MIT, where Richard serves on the advisory board, he started working at Purdue as his father's assistant at age 26 before eventually leading the firm's R&D division and, separately, its sales and marketing division. So like Arthur, he's not just a doctor who likes research. He's really into marketing and advertising. Mm, Maybe he should have just done that. Like, gosh, he he, could have been making ads, and there's a lot of money in advertisement. Yeah, I mean, he makes a lot of money in advertisement. It's just for (laughs) OxyContin. (laughs) It's not the thing you want him advertising. Now, Raymond took a step back during this period, presumably to allow his son to shine. One of Richard's colleagues during this time who lived through the transition recalled that the new boss brought a new intensity to the job. Richard really wanted Purdue to be big. I mean, really big. The best opportunity for that was, of course, a new drug based on the Contin system. The patent for MS Contin was about to run out, but Purdue scientists were developing a similar drug, basically a time-release version of an old opiate called oxycodone. Now, in the 1930s, oxycodone's most popular formation was scofidol, a mix of oxycodone, scopolamine, and ephedrine. It was basically an early speedball. The Wehrmacht loved it. It was like one of the most popular Nazi drugs of the whole Nazi era. During Operation Himmler, when the Germans staged a false flag attack on themselves to justify the invasion of Poland, the prisoners they dressed as Polish soldiers were all killed via massive injections of scopidol. So, oxycodone has a fun history before it became oxycontin. And Purdue is about to add a new chapter to that history. Esquire talked to Peter Lacoutre, uh, a senior director of clinical research at Purdue from 91 to 2001, and he explained how the idea evolved. At all the meetings, that was a constant source of discussion. What else can we use the content system for? And that's where Richard would fire some ideas, maybe antibiotics, maybe chemotherapy. He was always out there digging. So... Sally Allen, a former executive director for product management, added that Richard was very interested in the commercial side and also very interested in marketing approaches. He didn't always wait for the research results. So, by 1990, there was ample evidence that MS Contin had a dangerous potential for abuse. It had already become one of the most abused prescription opioids in the United States. But that, of course, did not make Richard any less likely to think it was a good product to market. You know, They kind of ignored the fact that there were already signs that time-release morphine was no less addictive than regular morphine and just sort of made time-release oxycodone and Ugh. assumed it would work just Wouldn't as well. Wouldn't the world be a better place if they were like, we really should do time-released antibiotics? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they decided not to do that. No. I mean, I think they probably made those at some point too. But antibiotics, nobody's gonna want to take a shitload of antibiotics. What about with the right advertising? You don't think? Yeah. <laughs> with the right pitch, don't you won't <laughs> die. Yeah, I, I'm not even sure how you advertise that stuff. Yeah, I uh, guess you're right. Yeah, oxycontin. You just have a picture of some guy sitting out at like a beach, and uh, it looks like he's an old guy with a surgery scar in his arm, but he's smiling, and it says like freedom, <laughs> oxycontin. Yeah, yeah. it's got a good name too. I hate to say it, but it's an exciting oh, yeah. name to just say. Yeah, and it, it's got one of those names that shortens well to a street drug. You got any yeah. oxy, bro? Like you know, MS content. Like nobody's gonna be like, you got any MS content? I guess, but <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, we're going to find out what happens next with Richard Sackler, the other Sacklers, and OxyContin. But first, some ads for products that hopefully aren't Purdue Pharmaceuticals. <laughs> that, that that might be. There's there's no knowing. It's randomly slotted in. So mm. uh, hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> we're back. So uh, in 1995, Purdue Pharmaceutical convened a series of focus groups with physicians trying to decide if they'd be willing to prescribe OxyContin, the company's new drug, for non-cancer pain. Most doctors were unwilling to do this. They worried about getting their patients horribly addicted to a dangerous drug and perhaps igniting an opioid epidemic. Purdue learned that physicians did want a long-lasting pain reliever that was less addictive than morphine. It was considered kind of like the holy grail of medicine at that point. Mm -hmm. Now, they didn't have such a drug. OxyContin was just as addictive as the old pills, perhaps even more addictive. But the focus groups taught them that there was an incredible potential in selling such a product, whether or not they actually had one. In 1995, Purdue Pharmaceutical released OxyContin onto the open market. At the company launch party for the new drug, Richard Sackler compared the launch of OxyContin to a natural disaster, asking the audience to imagine a blizzard or a hurricane, and saying, The launch of OxyContin tablets will be followed by a blizzard of prescriptions that will bury the competition. The prescription blizzard will be so deep, dense, and white. Oh, wow. Uh, Richard, no, don't, like, y you know what you're doing. Like, you know. He must have suspected. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds like he was... Thinking money was more important than people. Sounds like that might have been his only motivating factor. Yeah. The predecessor drug, MS Contin, had a reputation for being very prone to abuse. Many patients had figured out how to crush it and extract pure oxycodone, thus getting past that nasty time release thing and giving them a much more addictive drug. So Purdue instructed its sales staff to lie to doctors and say that this could not be done with oxycontin, even though their own internal studies showed that it was actually super easy to do with oxycontin. Well, I mean, I might be wrong. I grew up in the 90s, but was it a new invention crushing pills? Because that's always nope. been like, oh, you want that? Just crush it up. They've like, they didn't think that was part of oh, they, they did. an abuse strategy? They did. They knew it could be done. They'd done studies showing that it was really easy to extract pure oxycodone from oxycontin. They just lied to doctors and said oh, that it couldn't be done. Well, that'll that, do like, the trick. It, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was like, oh, it's really hard to make a pill people can't crush and then uh, purify and snort. Why don't we just lie? <laughs> yeah, this <laughs> this pill is fortified with iron. Who yeah. can bend iron? Hey, Superman? Superman? Yeah, you can't sell crush these pills. this pill. <laughs> it's, they, they have like one trial pill that's just made out of steel, and they're like, look, you can't crush it. <laughs> don't try the others. <laughs> don't try the others. Do not try the others. And don't use that Ginsu knife. <laughs> <laughs> now, as a pending Massachusetts lawsuit against the company alleges, quote, Doctors had the crucial misconception that OxyContin was weaker than morphine, which led them to prescribe OxyContin much more often. In 1997, Michael Cullen, a Purdue executive, wrote this letter to Richard Sackler. Since oxycodone is perceived as being weaker, a weaker opioid than morphine, it has resulted in OxyContin being used much earlier for non-cancer pain. Physicians are positioning this product where Percocet, hydrocodone, and Tylenol with codeine have traditionally been used. It is important that we be careful not to change the perception of physicians towards oxycodone when developing promotional pieces, symposia, review studies, articles, etc. Sackler's response to this was short and sweet. I think that you have this issue well in hand. So again, they think it's not addictive... Don't tell them the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they, they know what they're doing. That same year, Michael Friedman, the company head of sales, emailed his boss with similar concerns, correcting the false impression that doctors had about Oxy would be bad for business. Quote, it would be extremely dangerous at this early stage in the life of the product to make physicians think the drug is stronger or equal to morphine. We are well aware of the view held by many of physicians that oxycodone is weaker than morphine. I do not plan to do anything about it. Again, Richard Sackley replied, I agree with you. He then asked, is there a general agreement? Or are there some holdouts? Everybody on the board about lying to doctors? We <laughs> we all in the same the same boat here? Yeah, it's 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 pretty blatant criming. I mean, and there's a paper trail for this. It seems like yeah. like thousands of emails. And it's and, and unless I'm wrong, 
they're still selling Oxycontin today, right? Oh, I, I mean, yeah. Yeah, of I mean, unless it was this morning that there was a breaking news I missed. You're, you're not going to stop selling Oxycontin. And this is all like that you don't have exclusive access to this information? No, 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 no. There's been a number of big stories. We'll get to that in a little bit, how mm. this all came out. All right. Sorry, now, sorry. No, it's all good. Now, uh, all this was divulged as a result of a lawsuit filed by the state of Kentucky against Purdue in 2015. As you'd expect, the company had a ready explanation as to what Sackler and his executives did was not fraud. Here's ProPublica. Quote, Sackler, it said, supports that the company accurately disclosed the potency of OxyContin to healthcare providers. He takes great care to explain that the drug's label made it clear that OxyContin is twice as potent as morphine, Purdue said. Still, Purdue acknowledged it had made a determination to avoid emphasizing OxyContin as a powerful cancer pain drug out of a concern that non-cancer patients would be reluctant to take a cancer drug. So we didn't lie to doctors. We just didn't emphasize the truth so that people would keep taking the pills. So that's different from a lie. Yeah, it's a, it's not really that different from it's, a lie. It's not really. It's kind of just a lie. It's, it's, it's a lie. Yeah, it's kind of just a lie. Now, documents released from the Kentucky suit, as well as a lawsuit in Massachusetts, paint a picture that puts Richard Sackler square in the middle of Purdue's strategy to sell a shitload of OxyContin by lying about how strong it was. Seven other Sackler family members were also implicated. The strategy worked like gangbusters, netting the company $48 million in the first full year of sales. In an email to the company, Richard noted, Clearly, this strategy has outperformed our expectations, market research, and fondest dreams. So $48 million, this is back in the 90s, This right? is 1996, I think. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, that's the first year. Three years later, after tens of millions more in sales, he emailed this to an executive at Purdue. Quote, you won't believe how committed I am to make OxyContin a huge success. It is almost that I dedicated my life to it. After the initial launch phase, I will have to catch up with my private life again. <laughs> Just working too hard, lying to doctors. Poor guy. It sounds like he's got psychic stress. Yeah. Or psychic. Uh, he should try some liberty. Yeah, try some liberty. I hear it's great for psychic stress. <laughs> it's so liberating. It's liberating. <laughs> it wasn't psychic stress. What's it called? Psychic. No, I think this, that's the stress? term he that used. That was the word? Okay, yeah, psychic, psychic stress. stress. Yeah, I think that was the term he used. Yeah. Now, when he was deposed in Massachusetts, Richard Sackler denied that he had participated in any kind of gigantic lie to trick doctors into overprescribing OxyContin. According to ProPublica, he, quote, offered benign interpretations of emails that appeared to so show Purdue executives or sales representatives minimizing the risks of OxyContin and its euphoric effects. He denied that there was any effort to deceive doctors about the potency of OxyContin and argued that lawyers for Kentucky were misconstruing words such as stronger and weaker used in email threads. The term stronger in Friedman's email, Sackler said, meant more threatening, more frightening. There is no way that this intended or had the effect of causing physicians to overlook the fact that it was twice as potent. We weren't saying it's not stronger. We're saying it's not more threatening than morphine. It's just a little pill. It's not scary. Morphine <laughs> comes in a needle sometimes. That's scary. Well, I guess, I mean, I am not defending them. I yeah. already think they're a bunch of shitbags. Yeah. But honestly, there should be more questions about this. Why did Absolutely. they not ask? Okay, strength is one thing. The potency seems like a very scientific question to ask. Yeah, I mean, it, it does. It, it seems like a lot of doctors fell down on the job here. Yeah, we'll, I, we'll get into why in a little bit because they, 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 there's some doctors being shady as fuck in this in this story too. Uh, actually, quite a lot of them. Not surprising at all. Not surprising at all. Hey, man, you got a lot of fucking student loans to pay back when I, you get that MD. Like, yeah. <laughs> you write some pill prescriptions, that makes that shit easier. It's like all those doctors in L.A. You remember when it, like medical marijuana was like the thing, and there would be all those like old doctors who was just like signing pot prescriptions oh, as yeah. a retirement plan. Yeah, that was for a long time before Obamacare. <laughs> my only doctor. Yeah, <laughs> that was like yeah. the one doctor appointment I'd get. That, a that's year. the only doctor. And it appointment got scary I had. when he'd give me advice of like, "Oh, your blood pressure is pretty high. Oh my God, the pot doctor <laughs> wants me to cool off on coffee." When the pot doctor gives you real <laughs> medical advice, yeah, that's he's not like, a you great really moment. should go see someone. I'm yeah. like, no way, you're scaring me, sir. I remember my first pot doctor. It was near Venice Beach, that's... and I like walk into this shady, dirty office, and there's like, as I'm standing outside his office, there's a poster of. It's like a, a fake painting of the Mona Lisa, but she's got a blunt. And like, and then I go into the office, and the guy's wearing a lab coat, and I'm like, dude, you don't, you don't need to buy yeah. a lab coat. <laughs> you got that from the costume shop, <laughs> didn't you? This is we, LA. We know what's happening. I think we here. went to. Is it was he a really old guy with very a really old, thick accent? Very thick accent. Yeah, yeah. I think that. I, think we I mean, had the same doctor. He was a he was a hot doctor back yeah, in the. Yeah. I don't know what he's doing today. I hope he made enough to retire, because he should not be practicing medicine. I'm just crossing my fingers there's never an episode two about him and Behind the Bastards. I mean, yeah, I don't even remember that guy's name, but I, I'm sure he did something terrible to wind up being a pot doctor. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. So, Purdue's bald-faced lying to patients and doctors was enabled by the FDA. 
Curtis Wright, the FDA examiner who approved OxyContin's initial application, allowed the company to include this note on the package. Delayed absorption, as provided by OxyContin tablets, is believed to reduce the abuse liability of a drug. Wow, that word, Mm -hmm. believed. Believed. Wow. That word is doing a lot of weightlifting there. It's carrying the others, really. I mean, I'm a critical thinker, but Mm -hmm. when I see a word like believe, the first thing I do is stop believing and start thinking. Like looking things up. Yeah, looking things up, seeing maybe. <laughs> yeah. Is, it hard, is this the horribly addictive? The word believe addictive? is nine times out of ten a, a, a clue that you shouldn't. Yeah, you don't want to hear that from a doctor. Like, yeah, we believe this will help. Yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> I feel like you should know a little better. <laughs> I mean, I know medicine. Sometimes it's a crapshoot, but it's not not comforting to hear that. In 1996, the year after OxyContin's release, Curtis Wright quit the FDA. He was hired by another pharmaceutical company for a short while, and then hired by Purdue Pharmaceuticals. Esquire talked to him years later, and he offered this defense. Quote, At the time, it was believed that extended-release formulations were intrinsically less abusable. It came as rather a big shock to everybody, the government and Purdue, that people found ways to grind up, chew up, snort, dissolve, and inject the pills. Mm. We didn't didn't know people would do the thing that they do with every drug. Like, every, every single drug. It's yeah, like, of course they predicted people would be booping it, yeah. putting it in their butts, <laughs> but crushing them? But crushing the oh pills? Oh my God, where did they think of We'd it? never heard of this drug we made in the 80s. We had never heard of people railing mm-hmm. drugs. No. That, who, who, who would have guessed that? <laughs> come, come on, dude. Like, <laughs> you think people aren't going to find a way to get high off of a drug? Like, no. This is, this is the people we're talking about you here. You can get high on holding your breath? Yeah, you can get, we do. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Oh boy! Like I'm sure after that video of the dolphins passing pufferfish around went viral, there's people that are trying to figure out how to that. get I have heard wasted on that shit. About that, like, but I haven't seen it yet. I think you're gonna have like a scuba club that all dies. Not doing that it. I want to do it, but could I get high on pufferfish? I don't know. You know, I know a guy. He's a dolphin. Oh, but I know a dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll talk afterwards. We'll, we'll talk. We'll talk afterwards. I don't want to. I don't want to get the DEA on my ass for selling dolphin drugs. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so a major part of OxyContin's success was Purdue's novel strategy of declaring a war on pain. Over the course of the late 1990s, they poured millions and millions of dollars into backing doctors who supported opioid treatment for chronic pain. These doctors formed advocacy groups like the American Pain Society, the American Academy of Pain Medicine, and Purdue's own lobbying organization, Partners Against Pain. Partners. You, me, and this crippling pill addiction. Oh, my God. <laughs> All they, partners against pain. Did they really call it a war on pain? Yeah. And yeah. that was, in my, uh, I, again, I'm not great at history, but that's the same time the war on drugs was going on. Yeah, yeah, Is it that is. like a guerrilla, like, like clandestine war that we were running? Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's same like thing, right? It's like the war in Nicaragua. Where that's like this, was, yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's kind of uh, similar if we have a war on drugs and a war on pain using OxyContin. Yeah, using OxyContin, which is different from a drug... For reasons, <laughs> it's supplying arms to the Taliban. Okay, that's that's yeah, a different story, but it seems yeah, it's, like that's what the war on drugs would be. It's like when we sold missiles to Iran while giving missiles to Iraq to fight Iran. Like, that's it's the that of drugs. That's <laughs> yeah. the the lines I'm making. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These groups, which many consider to just be fronts for big pharma, operated by crooked doctors, pushed regulators to treat pain like the fifth vital sign. They advocated for a 10-point pain scale, which doctors should ask patients about during every visit. An internal Purdue strategy document explained that the goal of this was to, quote, attach an emotional aspect to non-cancer pain. This would hopefully cause doctors to treat it more seriously and aggressively, a.k.a. with OxyContin. Now, up until that point, pain had, to a certain extent, been something chronic sufferers just dealt with. Uh, There were obviously attempts to mitigate it as best as possible, but complete cessation of pain was seen as simply unrealistic, and the risk of giving chronic pain sufferers morphine was considered too high. With OxyContin, Purdue changed all that. The ironic thing is, it wasn't actually super effective against chronic pain. It was marked as lasting 12 hours so patients could sleep through a night free of agony, but most patients only got about 6 to 8 hours of relief. This meant they took more OxyContin, which meant they ran through their prescriptions faster, which led them to calling doctors in agony. When doctors questioned sales reps about this cycle, Purdue advised them to increase the dose rather than the dosing frequency, which guaranteed that the cycle would keep on keeping on and also increased Purdue's profits. Mm. Now, doctors aren't dumb, and many of them were hesitant about some of the claims Purdue was making. They were particularly can, concerned. Can I pause you yeah, just yeah, yeah. For, for a moment? Yeah. Now, when when I like everything with oxycotton right now, I understand that's its own beast. But the whole one to ten scale of pain, 
I'm a little confused on how authentic that is. Is that really a scientific method? Because I've heard that before, but what's to stop somebody? And I'm not t- telling anyone that their pain is not the number they say. Yeah. But what's to stop someone from saying their pain is something higher than it is? Nothing. Okay. I just yeah, want to make I mean, sure yeah, that there wasn't something I was missing. No, there, there's no way to, like, you can't, there's not, like, an objective measurement of, of pain. Like, you know, I, I know people who have chronic pain conditions for whom, like, you know, it, they'll get hurt, like, in a way that would, like, fuck me up for a day or two. And they just, like, sort of grin and bear it because they're so used to dealing with pain. So, yeah, like, there's no way to objectively measure pain. And I'm not saying, like, a 10-point pain scale is necessarily a bad idea, but Purdue introduced it specifically so that because it would make it easier for people to get prescribed Purdue oxycontin. Purdue introduced yeah. this? Yeah, they, oh they really Oh, my God. Had, I didn't realize they produced that I mean, it that was scale. doctors and stuff that they were funding. That they were, like, I mean, it was, it was a thing they wanted. I know the marionette man yeah, controls yeah. all the puppets. Exactly. <laughs> I'm not a fool. They were like, if, we, if, this, if this is the way people do this stuff, it'll be a lot easier to sell a shitload of oxycontin. And it was. Speaking of selling a shitload of things that aren't oxycontin, unless... The ad that gets randomly slotted in is for OxyContin. Good God, I hope not. I, it might be. There's no way to know. We've been having Koch Brothers ads. You know, they, who, <laughs> I'm sure a Blackwater ad will wind up soon. Like, well, the Koch Brothers are avid listeners. Oh, yeah, and they are. And you know what? In fairness to them, an awful lot of Behind the Bastards listeners need a lot of oil refined. Mm-hmm. I mean, I get that. I get a fan emailing me every week saying, like, I have all this crude oil and no way to refine it. Do you know where I can do that in such a way that it pollutes the Bay of Galveston beyond ecological salvage and i say the coke brothers oh wow yeah yeah that's they're, they're nice for that so uh if you need your crude oil refined check out uh the coke brothers refineries <laughs> and if you need anything else that we advertise uh, products we're back So, as I was saying, doctors are not dumb, and many of them were hesitant about some of the claims Purdue was making. They were particularly concerned about whether or not OxyContin caused euphoria. If you've never taken uh, opiates recreationally, you should know that they have a strong mood-altering component. Painkillers work on your emotions, too. You feel very happy, especially when coming up. It's kind of incredible. Of course, this is something that concerns doctors, because euphoria is the most addictive thing in the world. <laughs> like, If OxyContin caused it, then it, that might make it too dangerous to prescribe all willy-nilly. Thankfully, Purdue was there to lie to doctors and say their pills did not cause euphoria. Sometimes they'd admit that it could, but that it did so less than other opiates, which, of course, there was no evidence for. During the deposition, Richard Sackler was confronted with a 1998 note from a company salesman admitting that he, quote, talked of less euphoria when selling the drug to a doctor. Sackler argued in court that this was fine because 1998 was before there was, quote, an agreed statement of facts. Now, in legalese, an agreed statement of facts is a list of facts both parties in a lawsuit agree on and submit to a judge at the start of a case. So if I understand right, Richard Sackler was saying it was fine for his employees to lie to doctors about the fact that his pain medicine didn't cause euphoria because the company hadn't been sued yet, and so there wasn't an agreed-upon statement of facts. Like, that, that I think that's the argument he was making. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a murderer, because yeah. I haven't been... Yeah, I haven't been caught yet. Have you seen me kill anyone in this courtroom? Today? I, I rest my case. <laughs> like, ignore the blood on my shirt, please. <laughs> now, when the lawyer for the state asked, what difference does that make? If it's improper in 2007, wouldn't it be improper in 1998? Sackler replied, not necessarily. That's it. That's all you got to say in court. Wow. Yeah. I, I always pictured court much different than that. Yeah. The state did present him with more memos, and Sackler defended himself by saying that the claim of less euphoria could be true, and I don't see the harm. Mm. I'm going to quote from ProPublica again. The same issue came up regarding a note written by a Purdue sales representative about one doctor. Got to convince him to counsel patients that they won't get buzzed as they will with short-acting opioid painkillers. Sackler defended these comments as well. Well, what it says there is that they won't get a buzz, and I don't think that telling a patient, I don't think you'll get a buzz is harmful, he said. Sackler added that the comments from the representative to the doctor actually could be helpful because maybe patients won't get a buzz, and if he would like to know if they do, he might have had a good medical reason for wanting to know that. Maybe because he wanted to know if they were going to get addicted or not, telling them won't get a buzz will cause you to prescribe an addictive drug to people not thinking it will get them addicted. Yeah, because if yeah. you're not getting a buzz, then why would you do it addictive? Yeah, exactly. If it's not going to give you a buzz, if, once they develop a painkiller that doesn't get you high, that's great. Like, I mean, and I say this as a guy who loves getting high on painkillers. That's like one of the best medicines you could possibly invent is something that just stops pain and doesn't have an abuse potential, uh, which is what they were saying OxyContin was. Mm. But, you know, 
drive through the Midwest, <laughs> you will see that it is not. Oh, it causes so much pain. Yeah. It, it really it, does. It's uh, nightmarish. Now, uh, between 1996 and 2001, the number of OxyContin prescriptions in the U.S. went from 300,000 to 6 million. Now, this might sound to you, if your podcast, if Alchemy This, went from 300,000 downloads in a week to 6 million, I assume everybody at Alchemy This would be happy. I know oh, I'd yeah. be happy. I mean, so- Sophie, we'd be super psyched. Richard Sackler was not happy with this. In 1999, when employee Michael Friedman told him that Purdue was now making more than $20 million a week, Sackler replied instantly to his email after midnight that sales were, in his opinion, not so great. After all, if we are to do $900 million this year, we should be running at $75 million a month. So it looks like this month it could be $80 or $90 million. Blah, humbug, yawn, where was I? Wow. Only $20 million a week, man. This Has he what seen I the play You Cannot Take people. It With You? It's You Can't Take It With You. Yeah. It's, at a certain point, everyone, as far as I know, unless yeah. Purdue has figured out a cure, you're yeah. going to have to leave it all behind. Yeah. You can't spend all that, Richard. But I'd sure like to be challenged, too. <laughs> I mean, I feel like if I made $20 million in a lifetime, that would allow me to live beyond my wildest dreams. If I had, That's enough money for a I Zeppelin. If I three months rent in the bank today... <laughs> I, w- I wouldn't be crying my, well, myself home. This is one of those things. I don't tend to, I think it's actually dangerous to like talk jokingly too much about like guillotines and stuff. But like when you look at people living this way and then you realize that like something like 70% of Americans have less than $1,000 in the bank. It's like, where do you think this is going to end, buddy? Like yeah. you're selling poison to people and you're not happy at 20 million a week. And there's people like worried that they have to choose between insulin and food for the month. Like, what do you think the long term is on this? Like- uh, it's frustrating. It's, like, uh, and that's the nicest way you could put yeah, it. Yeah, that's the nicest. It's very frustrating. <laughs> now, uh, by 2001, Purdue held more than half of the market share for long-acting opioids. That year was also the first year annual sales of OxyContin broke $1 billion. So in the span of five years, OxyContin sales went from $48 million in a year to $1 billion in a year. The New York Times article that announced this noted that these sales were, quote, even more than Viagra. If you have found a way to sell people something that they want more than erections, you're selling a drug, like a dangerous drug. Like, I I feel like that's across the board true. Yeah. Now, that New York Times report also noted that the drug had been involved in the deaths of at least 120 people. In the year 2000, the Sackler family was warned that a journalist was, quote, sniffing around the OxyContin abuse story. The family discussed this threat during their next board meeting and crafted a... Wait, this is only the year 2000? We're just up to 2000, yeah. I had... I had a I I knew somebody that died of oxycotton before the year two thousand. Mm-hmm. How is there only one hundred and twenty people uh, cases of people dead then? Oh, there were more, but like the, this is just what they'd confirmed. Like we're talking about okay. like journalists digging into it before wow. this was common knowledge. So they they had found one hundred and twenty cases, but like obviously there were probably thousands at that point. Yeah, that's crazy that they're only starting to discover. I guess in my world, I thought that that was something. Not to go to it's not my therapy session, but. When I was younger, yeah. people were taking Oxycontin, and it was not that bad. Like, everybody was like, oh, this is just a pill that you get from yeah. the doctor's office, and they'd abuse the shit out of it. Yeah. It's like, well, at least it's not heroin. But yeah. then, then obviously, the next step is heroin. Yeah, the next step is heroin, and then you wind up in that fentanyl shit, and then you die. Yeah. I don't think fentanyl was around when I was no, a kid. No, fen- fentanyl, that's yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. They were just moving to heroin Thank then. God. I mean, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Sorry, that's sorry, some sorry. scary just, stuff. Yeah. When I hear them say 120 people dead in 2000, I'm like, that can't. No, true. that was just like who the New York Times could confirm. Yeah. It's like I mean, I assume there was a lot of legwork behind. Probably, that. Um, I, mean, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe the pharmaceutical company was trying to hide it. That's exactly huh. what we're about to get to. So the family discussed this threat during their next board meeting and crafted a response that was their their goal was that the response quote deflects attention away from the company owners. So the the the, the Sacklers who made up the majority of the Purdue board when they hear that a journalist is sniffing around is like okay well. They're going to probably figure out that a lot of people are dying on Oxy, but we got to keep our names out of this shit. We don't want to hurt the family. Mm. Sounds a little bit like the mob. Shortly thereafter, Time put together an article on OxyContin deaths. Concerned Purdue employees asked Richard Sackler, then the CEO, about this. He wrote that the Times coverage was not, quote, balanced, blamed the deaths on drug addicts, and assured them, we intend to stay the course and speak out for people in pain who far outnumber the drug addicts abusing our product. Wow, that mm-hmm. sounds like such a familiar tone. Yeah. I don't know. It's reminiscent of, of arguments I've heard from idiots to yeah. this day. Yeah, unnamed idiots. Yeah. In 2001, there were about eight drug overdose deaths for every 100,000 Americans. By 2010, that number had almost doubled to 15 deaths per 100,000. On a national scale, this equated to tens of thousands of new dead people, and most of them were dying from opiate painkillers, including OxyContin. 
Now, many of them were actually ODing on heroin, but it just so happened that most of those deaths were, of course, folks who got hooked initially on an opiate painkiller, like our good friend OxyContin. In January of 2001, Richard Sackler received a request for help from a Purdue sales associate. The rep had been to a community meeting at a local high school, convened by a group of mothers whose kids had all overdosed and died on OxyContin. Quote, statements were made that OxyContin sales were at the expense of dead children, and the only difference between heroin and OxyContin is that you can get OxyContin from a doctor. The very next month, a story dropped that 59 people had died in a single month from OxyContin in the state of Massachusetts. Richard's response was this, quote, this is not too bad. It could have been worse. <laughs> yeah, could have been more people. It will be soon. The very next week, a mother wrote a letter to Purdue Pharmaceutical, stating, quote, my son was only 28 years old when he died from OxyContin on New Year's Day. We all miss him very much, his wife especially on Valentine's Day. Why would a company make a product that strong, 80 and 160 milligram, when they know it will kill young people? My son had a bad back and could have taken Motrin, but his doctor started him on Vicodin, then OxyContin, then OxyContin SR. Now he is dead. A Purdue staff member responded to this by saying simply, I see a liability issue here. Any suggestions? They, that was like the, the company response. It's like, oh, this mom's... We might we might get sued over this. Like, no no other concerns. Later that month, Richard Sackler finally came up with a solution to this problem so many people were whining about for some reason. He wrote in a confidential company email, quote, We have to hammer on the abusers in every way possible. They are the culprits and the problem. They are reckless animals. According to a state of Massachusetts lawsuit filed, like, this year, Quote, Richard followed that strategy for the rest of his career. Collect millions from selling addictive drugs and blame the terrible consequences on the people who became addicted. By their misconduct, the Sacklers have hammered Massachusetts families in every way possible, and the stigma they used as a weapon made the crisis worse. So, get people addicted to a drug, then encourage the criminalization of that abuse and attack the users themselves, which will, of course, make people less likely to get help, which will make them more yeah, likely to buy more of your drug. you're a villain when you're yeah. actually a victim. Keeps you it's, buying oxy. The only thing that would make it worse is if the Sackler family started investing in privatized prisons. <laughs> Tell yeah. me they didn't. Tell no, me they no, didn't. No. I mean, actually, they may have. I, they, a lot of their money is dark, but we will get to what they spend their money on <laughs> oh, a no. little bit later. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, Don't tell me. It's pretty bad. <laughs> This strategy worked for a little while, but by 2010, the nation had started to wake up to the dangers of OxyContin, and Purdue was forced to carry out what Esquire describes as a breathtaking pivot. Quote, Embracing the arguments critics had been making for years about OxyContin's susceptibility to abuse, the company released a new formulation of the medication that was harder to snort or inject. Purdue seized the occasion to rebrand itself as an industry leader in abuse deterrent technology. The change of heart coincided with two developments. First, an increasing number of addicts, unable to afford OxyContin's high street price, were turning to cheaper alternatives like heroin. Second, OxyContin was nearing the end of its patents. Purdue suddenly argued that the drug it had been selling for nearly 15 years was so prone to abuse that generic manufacturers should not be allowed to copy it. Three years later, on April 16th, 2013, the day several OxyContin patents were set to expire, the FDA gave Purdue what they wanted, banning anyone else from selling generic OxyContin. Purdue basically extended the profitability of their chief cash cow by arguing that it was too dangerous to let anyone else sell. And did that stand? Yeah. yeah. So now I have mixed feelings. I think it's awful, mm -hmm. and there should not be generic versions of OxyContin out there. Yeah. Uh, so less is better no matter how you put it. You don't want to just give more weapons to people just because one person has it. Do you think, and I, it's probably impossible to say, that lives were saved by not giving that patent generic like options? I doubt it. Uh, I, I seriously doubt it. I like. I don't think it did anything but allow Purdue to keep profiting from it. Like If there was any reduce in loss of life from that, it was canceled out from the fact that that they were marketing this and pushing it so heavily to doctors and continuing mm -hmm. to do so and continuing to try to get it on the market. Because that like it was I, I wouldn't give them any credit for that. Yeah, it, I can't give them credit because it's yeah. just out of greed. But I just wonder what would have happened if it was opened up to generic markets. Well, uh, you could know, it have been even more abused? You you could argue that it 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 might have made the situation better because yeah, it's cheaper, but also that means that addicts aren't gonna bankrupt themselves de doing it. They're not gonna have to steal shit in yeah. order to afford it. And like you know, you, you do find that when there's places, I think Denmark's one of them, where they'll give heroin addicts free heroin, mm -hmm. like the government will. And you, you like you go to a, a government clinic and they'll they'll give you the heroin to inject and stuff. And they find out that, number one, it doesn't create more addicts. And number two, the government saves money because they're not out committing crimes. They're not breaking yeah. into houses and stealing shit in order to like – so 
you could argue that it, again, made things worse on the addicts by there not being a, a generic available, even though it's not great for people to be addicted to oxy. It's, it's one of those hard questions that is it, above my it, brain scale. And you also might argue that it killed more people because OxyContin is safer than heroin. And if you can't afford OxyContin, you're just going to go to heroin or fentanyl. Yeah, um, so actually, could, that's yeah, true. Yeah, you could argue that if there was just cheap oxy, maybe we'd have a few more addicts, but we'd have less overdoses. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think they might have killed more people that way. Hmm. Now, Richard Sackler's personal attitude towards the harm his drug was doing is illustrated by the case of Purdue, Germany. According to ProPublica, quote, Sackler pushed company officials to find out if German officials could be persuaded to loosen restrictions on the selling of OxyContin. In most countries, narcotic pain relievers are regulated as controlled substances because of the potential for abuse. Sackler and other Purdue executives discussed the possibility of persuading German officials to classify OxyContin as an uncontrolled drug, which would likely allow doctors to prescribe the drug more readily, for instance, without seeing a patient. Fewer rules were expected to translate into more sales, according to company documents disclosed at the deposition. In other words, in Germany and all across the EU, Richard Sackler's goal was to be able to sell OxyContin not as a prescription medication, but as an uncontrolled painkiller. And that's not the same as over-the-counter? I think it's a little different it's from over-the-counter. Different. Counter. You have to have yeah. somebody tell you to get it, but you, you don't necessarily have to go through a doctor visit. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what that means. Like, you don't have to go to a – like, like a do, like yeah, you, you can't, like, just pick it up like a, you can in Guatemala, for example. Um, but you can you can get it without there being any of the controls that we put on, like, dangerous and drugs. And was like there that. argument later that they were just simply just saying, no, Germany, we were saying it was out of control. These drugs are out of control. <laughs> no, uh, they, they were the ones who made it. I'm kind of surprised they didn't take that, <laughs> that argument. Yeah. Robert Keiko, one of the men who'd actually developed OxyContin, warned Richard Sackler when he learned of this plan, quote, if OxyContin is uncontrolled in Germany, it is highly likely that it will eventually be abused there and then controlled. Richard's response to Keiko showed zero concern about the impact of releasing an addictive drug uncontrolled onto an entire continent. How substantially would it improve your sales? A lot. Yeah. A lot. When the German government ruled that OxyContin would be treated like any other addictive narcotic, Richard asked if it was possible to appeal. A German Purdue executive told him that this was not possible, and Sackler wrote back, tersely, When we are next together, we should talk about how this idea was raised and why it failed to be realized. I thought it was a good idea if it could be done. <laughs> how? I, I'm sorry. What What year was this just generally? Is this more recent? Is this yeah, like, th- this is like in the late 2000s. Uh, late late, late, this is pretty recently, yeah. So, and I don't know a lot about Germany. I've never been there. Uh, but I've worked in video games, and I know that Germany has some strict rules on video games, and yeah. people are bringing video games from outside so they can get past you know certain ratings. Right. Now, I would imagine that that means if these are uncontrolled substances, doesn't that affect all the countries that are around Germany that they'd be flooded with oxycotton? Yeah, it sure it could have those caused a nightmare epidemic. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Thankfully, the Germans were like took one look at the U.S. and were like. <laughs> I don't think we want that here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We already we already had enough of a problem with 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 opiates in our past. Uh, we're we're good. We're good. So that's what we got today. When we come back on Thursday, we're going to talk about among other things uh, the court case in two thousand seven against Purdue Pharmaceutical, uh, the ongoing legal stuff now, and of course we're going to get a lot into the marketing of OxyContin, which we haven't really talked about that much this episode. But there is quite a lot to say. But that's all next Thursday. Do you want to plug your pluggables before I mean, we roll out? I mean, if you're still, if you didn't hear at the beginning because you were fast forwarding, here it is. Alchemy This releases every Tuesday and Thursday. It is funny. We get suggestions from the audience and we make an improv show up. It's with Kevin Pollack. Yes, that Kevin Pollack. And we have a live show May 7th at the Dynasty Typewriter Theater in Los Angeles. Please come. So check it out, Dynasty Typewriter Theater, May 7th. James Heaney, you want to plug in of your uh, your social media? Oh yeah, you can find me at the Heen T H E H E A M. That's on Twitter, uh, and a great way to find me is briefnewsbrief.com. It has all the different ways to get a hold of me. Awesome. Well, check out James Heaney on the internet, and check out this podcast on the the web at behindthebastards.com. Um, check us out on uh, Twitter and the gram at at bastards pod, and buy a shirt. You can buy a cup holder. Uh, you could buy uh, an, an SBG-9 recoilless rifle branded with a uh, Behind the Bastards logo and uh, and equipment in case you've got to take out a T-72, you know, Ooh. like like we all find ourselves needing to do at some point. So what else, what else are we doing? Is that all the plugs? Oh, I have another show called It Could Happen Here. It could happen in <gasps> oh, your ear. I've been listening to the ads for it. It's not out yet, is it? Oh, it is. Oh, my gosh. I'm super excited Episode about the Civil three. War could happen here it, in the it States. Sh- it sure could. And uh, spoiler, it... 
You don't want it to. No, I'm not <laughs> it, surprised. It, it, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be good. Uh, I. I actually am really excited to listen to it. I'm still. I'm embarrassed. I'm still finishing up. End of the world. But once I'm oh, done yeah, with that's that, yeah. that's my next one. Well, uh, make it your next one, listener, because it will make you sad and scared, and we all want to be sad and scared, don't we? All right. Well, we'll be back Thursday. <laughs> I'm very hungover right now, so I, this has been a little bit of a scattered, scatterbrained episode. Sophie's saying it's she's very aware of this fact. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, this is the end of the episode. Daniel's looking at me like, when when the fuck are you gonna stop? And uh, it's now, right now, right this moment, now.